good evening. I think this is the last talk of the day. Hope everyone had a good session. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about hybrid desktop applications, and what this means is the ability to create native applications which runs on your users' desktops and devices, which are powered by HTML5, the user interface. Now, before we begin, let me just introduce myself. My name is Anirudh. and i've co-founded a company called razorflow i'm the technical lead over there and i've been working for 3 years and after numerous uh, changes in the technology stack ultimately we've settled on html5 now i've got a lot of experience with the front end and the back end and this is something that uh, now why are we why, why am i even talking about this now one of the things is we had a problem ourselves where the only solution out of it was to build a desktop app which is run like which the user interface in html5 now to do that there are plenty of options out there and we spent a lot of time evaluating a few of them and uh, finding out what were the options were there and i just wanted to share whatever we learned with you now this is exactly what we do we have got a tool called the razorflow dashboard framework what it does is you basically pull your data out you give us your data and it builds you html5 dashboards which work all the across across all the devices without much of a headache now in other words it just lets you build a bunch of charts and tables and stuff like that now one of the things that we did decided early on when we were doing a technology refresh was that we're not going to be going in for supporting all the older browsers because we knew the future was in html5 now this meant that you know by essentially focusing primarily on modern browsers we could do some pretty interesting stuff like for example we could do offline access your data comes in offline and you know like next time you are somewhere on a flight it going to work we could do notifications such that if your data changed it would give you notifications we do automatic updates streaming and some other stuff now i'm pretty sure everyone who's familiar with html5 know that all the stuff that we want to do right now is already available you've got html5 application manifest offline you've got notifications html5 notifications you've got automatic updates and all this other stuff now here's the real problem our problem is that the top product goes mainly to developers now they use it to build tools for their users now sometimes sometimes the users even if they're on ie9 or ie10 they refuse to switch to a completely modern browser like chrome firefox or safari or even ie11 which has a much Oh, right. The problem is most of them didn't switch to browsers which had all the features we were looking for. Now, most of them were on browsers with most of the features. So, the funny thing is when we talk to a lot of these users, they're perfectly fine downloading an application that you know runs on their desktop with an EXE kind of thing. But nobody is comfortable downloading a new browser because I mean, let's face it, it's about switching an entire browser. So what we felt was the only way out of this was to pretty much disguise a browser, ship an entire browser to them, and disguise it as a desktop application. Now, to do this, so to do this, people who wanted advanced functionality would be asked to download a separate tool. And uh, so far, we haven't completely launched this yet, but from whatever initial feedback we've gotten from talking to people, it's so far been good. Now, that's essentially what I'm talking about is our use case. So we had a genuine use case for this, and we wanted to figure out a solution which worked. Now let's talk about why you would want to build an app like this. Uh, what kind of benefit does it bring in? Now there are certain reasons why you might want to build a desktop app rather than a web app. Uh, so the first one, of course, is extreme I/O. you can't build you know if you're trying to build a photoshop or a video editor or one of these kind of things which need to do a lot of io it's sometimes or actually most of the times much faster to write to the hard disk directly rather than write to the cloud the other option is it works offline and it's not just about storing your resources your off assets offline it's just about everything runs truly offline and one more option is for sometimes for beginners it's much more comfortable for them to just have a desktop application that they can run and also sometimes it just is a better choice you have to use your own good judgment now 
essentially a hybrid app theoretically means that it's run on native technology but the ui is built using web technologies now this fact of using a ui so first of all i was talking about why it's better to build a desktop app than a web app when it is better now why is it if you have a hybrid desktop app now you've got your app front end over here you got your app front end which is run by a html renderer well as your app back end uses your operating systems in the or some other cross platform library to do things like network file system and hardware uh, and things like that like for example if you want to do things like playing multiple sound files or doing some other more complex sound or video stuff that not support in html you can do this now there are some huge benefits of using html versus desktop graphical toolkits now when i say desktop toolkits i mean things like you know uh, uh wpf win forms and all of these other things with menus and buttons and things like that so the first of it is if you're already a web programmer or you already have a web design web person on your team it's usually much more quicker for them to build a ui for this the next thing is it gives you completely fluid layouts now one thing that desktop apps aren't very good at is a lot of text and usually you need to get a lot of other libraries for it html is way better at it you also got a lot of really good ui libraries that you can uh, download purchase some of them are open source some of them are uh, commercial you can use whichever ones you want another benefit is you've got a lot more control over the look and feel of your application because everything's controlled using css and this means that you can usually change the entire look of the application overnight and it looks more consistent across platforms something that you do not get out of uh, most other uh, systems the other thing is graphics and when i mean graphics i mean the ability to quickly draw graphical shapes on the screen now i know that desktop interfaces have got things like cairo and uh, uh, other stuff and core draw for mac and stuff like that but fundamentally svg and canvas are just much more faster not in terms of performance but in terms of being able to prototype uh, but it also gives you direct access from the rest of your application to this and you've got some lovely libraries like backbone ember which do this uh, model view view model pattern which allows you to build application with less code but on the other hand be aware that there are some benefits of using regular desktop toolkits versus html as well now, the first of it is consistency now, the thing about having a consistent web application is that it works exactly your users already know a little bit about how to use it before they even use it like for example everyone's used to a file menu and edit menu and stuff like that and if the menus are in the same place where it is which is in the case if you use a desktop toolkit your users feel more at home the other option is you've got better 3d and gaming now that's just something that is pretty obvious but i'm get pretty sure that very few people over here do hardcore 3d gaming applications the other option is actually static layouts so here's a very interesting thing because most of these desktop layouts were originally built uh built to build like it was built from the ground up to do interfaces now we're actually going and you know as web developers we're trying to recreate this and recreate interfaces some of the stuff the web does do better but on the other hand one thing the web is actually pretty bad at is making a layout which uh like when you resize the browser it still remains consistent for this you need to do a lot of javascript magic or you need to rely on third party libraries like exejs kendo or one of these other ones to really take care of the heavy lifting for you that said let's look at a few people who are already doing this let's look at a few people who already have html ui for their desktop applications the first one is adobe brackets uh, this is i think would probably be uh, one of the most popular ones around now what this is is a html css javascript editor written in html css and javascript uh, apart from that being a pretty catchy tagline it's allowed uh, the developers of brackets to quickly iterate and add functionality at a pace that most other editors have not been able to the other thing is it's also it's, it's sponsored by adobe it's turned transitioning into another product called adobe edge code but so another one is google web designer or uh, actually it's designed primarily to uh, help you make ads which are animate and stuff like that but run on html5 but on the other hand you can use it to make css animations html animations as well now if you look at the ui you know a lot of people might in fact think it's something like photoshop but in fact the entire ui is built in html now this gives them you know the ability to ship the same app on mac and windows without significant effort between the two one more is steam now steam what most people don't know in fact it looks and feels so much like a regular desktop app but most people don't know that the majority of steam is actually powered by webkit now steam is a game delivery platform and what that is it's it's by valve 
and uh, the guys who made Half Life and those games. Now, what this does is it basically handles a lot of stuff like you know downloading uh, several gigabytes of stuff and doing all sorts of things. So all of that's handled by the native code. Uh, whereas on the other hand, the entire UI feels fluid, it feels flexible, and all of that's handled by the UI. And this is one of the perfect examples, in my opinion, of when it's a great idea to have your native code handle all the heavy lifting and your HTML handle your UI. Another one is Wonderlist. So this is a pretty popular app, which again most people have on. So the same, they have, they have, they have the same app running on their browsers, on your desktop, on pretty much any scenario you want, and it looks and feels the same. And this is again thanks to HTML5. Uh, now. Let's say you have considered it and you want to do you want to build an app which runs on your desktop. Now these are some of the options that you have available to you. Now I will be going into detail for some of them, which we felt were good. There are actually several others. Now this is something that this is an idea that's been around for a while, and this is something that uh, people have been thinking about and talking about for a while. So now the fundamental thing is if you want to if since we have so many options and I'm trying to convince you which one is better for you and which one's not. Uh, there needs to be a way to evaluate it. And to evaluate it, what we decided to do was we we're going to build one single application across several different uh, platforms. This is inspired by the To Do MVC project, which aims to test different MVC frameworks by building the same app in multiple things. So you can see which works better and not. What we do is we just built a very simple text editor. Now, uh, it can just open save files. It doesn't sound very fancy, but here it actually tests some very significant aspects of the entire application. Now, the first aspect that we want to test is how well can it integrate with the native stuff? Like, how can it talk to the file system? Is there a way to talk to the file system and native stuff without really any uh, major work? And the second thing is how can you add extra JavaScript assets? So, we use a tool called Code Mirror, which is a JavaScript library which enables you to have a small uh, text editing kind of thing inside HTML. So, these are mainly what we try and evaluate. Well, sorry. So, the first thing that we look at when we evaluate it is compatibility. Now, if we do write an app, which so one of the things that we do with HTML is we don't make it look the same all across. This is a problem that we also see with uh, when people use PhoneGap to build PhoneGap or one of these kind of things to build it for different mobile devices. People prefer to have native experiences. So, obviously, this means that in case if you do build something using HTML, you want it to support as many platforms as you want. You want to have the maximum payoff for the effort that you put in. So we do look at what all platforms will it support. The second thing is we look at how much native functionality can we access. Now, essentially one of the problems of being in a browser is you're in a sandbox. Despite how much ever JavaScript and HTML may evolve, you're still inside a sandbox. There's a lot of resources you have no access to. Now, can we access more of it using this particular model? Now, that's one more thing that we look at. The second thing which we look at, which is a very important thing, is productivity. Fundamentally, it all comes down to turnaround time. And by turnaround time, I mean if you just make a change, how much time will it take for you to see if the change worked or not? The second thing that we also see is how much time will it take for an average person to set up a project? Uh, not just you know, not if, not just if they provided instructions, but if they're just trying to set up one from scratch, how will they do it? And the third thing is, will it integrate well with build systems? Like a lot of people prefer lighting things, using using things like less and copy script and things like that. It does it work well with them. And the last thing that we look at is deployment. So in deployment, what we mean is you've finished your app, you've built it, and now you want to ship it out to your users. Now, how do you do that? One of the things is uh, the Mac Apple App Store came out and uh, now a lot of applications are distributed through the Mac App Store. So that's a major thing because App Store has a, a set of sandboxing requirements which all of your tools have to be compatible with and one more thing is do your users have to download anything extra is there any extra stuff they have to do before they run through your installer and one more thing is how easy is it to update your application now because obviously one of the benefits that we all enjoy as web developers especially if you're running a SaaS kind of product is it's very easy for you to update something and all the updates are pretty much uh, streamed out to all of your users instantly so first of all let me talk about node webkit this is one of the tools available, one of the most popular tools available for uh, building desktop apps in HTML5. And it's popular for good reason, because it usually combines the best features of Node and the best features of WebKit and gives it to you in one nice, lovely package. Now, let me just give you a small, these two lines over here, 
can, can I just get a quick show of hands? How many people are JavaScript developers over here? Okay, so if you've all worked with Node, uh, do you know that? Whoa. So you know that uh, in web development, it works in a very standard format. You know, you've got your server, which has all of your business logic and stuff like that. You've got your client, and they communicate through some kind of flaky protocol like REST or uh, SOAP or WSDL or something like that. But what happens is you always have two separate places where you're running your code. Even if you run Node.js, you're running JavaScript on the server, JavaScript on the client. But here with Node WebKit, you're actually doing the first line. The first line actually runs on Node which reads a file from your file system. The second line takes the same variable and it uses jQuery to append it inside of the page. Now what's happening over here is something, you know, which many of many people, including myself, thought impossible. You're actually, you know, doing something right on the native level or on the JavaScript level, and it's a seamless bridge. You don't have to worry about serializing your objects. You don't have to worry about, you know, figuring out ways to share code. It's always the same thing. Now, this means that, you know, this means that Node WebKit has some really good benefits. Now, the first benefit is that it's extremely easy to get started. Uh, so much so that, you know, you can just read the readme and you can get started within a few minutes. Now, it's also pretty straightforward to package and deploy. Now, they've got a command line tool, which means that you can just, you know, run it against the command line tool. You can just tell what assets you have. It's going to package something up for you and you can distribute it to your users straight away. Uh, the third thing is it also imports assets very easily. Now, this is extremely crucial because if you're running a web app and especially if you're trying to, you know, figure out some way that you can sharing your code between your website and your desktop application, you want to be able to have a way to share your assets well. Now, a lot of times what happens is a lot of systems, they have a separate registry for your assets. This means that, you know, you need to go add your asset into the file system and then into another folder and into another file, an XML file and things like that. Now that becomes a problem, especially when people check in code and they don't update the assets. Uh, and also sometimes, you know, it's it's pretty tricky. A lot of these guys who do HTML5 applications have, have a lot of problem with assets. Now, the downside is actually that you're constrained to Node. Now, for example, there's no native functionality in Node to play a sound file. There is no native functionality in Node to, you know, do a lot of things. And for example, if you want to have, you have a library written in C, which you want to, you know, use, there should be technically ways to use uh, certain Node packages and uh, other libraries in Node, which basically go directly to the server. I mean, a lot of these Node libraries, which are written in C and, you know, allow you to run uh, native stuff. But we had some trouble getting them to work. But fundamentally, this means that just think about it as you have all your browser stuff, but also you have your Node stuff. And it's usually a lot more tricky to get everything else. And one major problem with Node WebKit applications, as from whatever we read on the official site, is that you cannot upload this to the Mac App Store. This is because it uses some APIs which are marked as private by Apple. This means that you have to, if you're planning to sell this on the App Store or something like that, this is not something you can use. Now, <clears throat> with the scorecard for Node family, is it scores pretty well. Now, this means is is open source, it's well maintained, and your backend is in JavaScript as well. It's pretty straightforward to set up. As I told you, the problem with packaging and distribution is that it's not very readily compatible for a lot of things because it just does not give you one single binary that you can ship out to your users. There are like multiple binaries. You need to write uh, another uh, shortcuts and things like that. It's, it's not very straightforward for users. But if you're using it for like a temporary hack, it is very easy to get started with. Uh, the next thing is actually Chromium Embedded Framework. Now, this guy is the biggest, most, uh, you know, powerful one. So, a little history about Chromium Embedded Framework. Now, a lot of people get confused between Chromium Embedded Framework or CEF and the Chrome App Store or uh, Chrome Desktop Apps or something like that. Now, what Google's done very, late, very lately, which has created a lot of confusion with people, is they've enabled you to write a Chrome extension which runs directly on your desktop. I mean, it looks like, okay, fine, it looks like a regular desktop app. You've got your shortcut, you double-click the shortcut, it pops up, and, you know, you've got your app writing or running over there. Now, that's one very major difference between this and that. Now, CEF does not require you to have Chrome installed because the funny thing about Chrome is you've got your uh, browser with all the browser Chrome, which is the back button, the address bar, and stuff like that. Now, this is the same Chromium code base 
with nothing. It just has the browser directly. Now this means that you need to do a lot of stuff on your own. You need to do things like cookie management and uh, some other difficult stuff on your own. But you need to write it in, you need to write the entire backend in C++ or Objective-C. You need to compile it and rewrite it differently for each platform that you're trying to support. Now, so to help you clearly understand whether CEF is the right tool for you or not, I made a little flowchart. So first thing you need to ask yourself is, do you really know C++ or C Objective-C really well? If you don't, sorry. The other thing is think about it whether your app backend is really heavier maintained. I mean, maybe not right now, but say, you know, two, three years in the future, you guys are trying to build something and the app backend is something insanely big and you're trying to recommend this to your engineers. And if it's not, just it's not worth the effort. I think is be really 100% sure that your experience with native code this is not something that you can just pick up, uh, you know, just like that. And only once you're sure about it, even then it's a maybe. You have to take the call really carefully. All right. But on the other hand, here's, here's the thing. We just could not figure out how to copy a file from the file system to the text editor. We just could not. We spent almost like three, four hours at it. But we had no idea how to make the native stuff talk to the JavaScript stuff. Uh, we, just, we just got confused. And we were trying to compile it half the time. But there are some benefits to Chrome CEF. The first of all, the fact that everyone uses it. I mean, Adobe Brackets uses it, Steam uses it, and you know, uh, a lot of these big things, all of them use CEF. Primarily because it's stable, it's well maintained, and it has this ridiculous Chromium standard of engineering, which you probably don't get with most other software products. The other thing it does, it gives you a huge amount of flexibility. Like, for example, the recommended way of starting out with CEF is that you have to compile the entire thing, which includes compiling WebKit. I mean, this literally, it takes you, you know, it's a four gigabyte thing which gets compiled and stuff like that. But ultimately, it gives you so much control. You want to disable, enable certain parts of WebKit, you can go ahead and do that. The other thing is you've got complete native access. This means that when you're running on C++, you can load any shared runtime library. You can ship your own static dynamic libraries. But long story short, anything that you want to do with the computer that you want to make the user's computer do, you can have it done. Now, the, doc the downsides. The documentation is not so great. I'm just saying that it, I'm, I'm taking a leap of faith when I say the documentation is not good because I couldn't find the documentation at all. Uh, the other thing is you need a really strong native application background. And there's no Mac App Store support according to a lot of people who we saw. But again, we couldn't find a definitive answer to this. But on the other hand, it's open source, it's well maintained, and uh, it's a pain and it's it's pretty painful to set it up. And uh, you need to drive different backend code for different systems. Now, Tide SDK was this thing called Absolutator Titanium. So Absolutator Titanium started uh, out for mobile and desktop and eventually they started focusing more on mobile and on the other hand they broke off and then now they have this open source thing called Tide SDK. Now Tide SDK actually allows you to have Ruby, Python and PHP on the back end, one of the three and it also has a really nice app manager tool which allows you to quickly you know just get started just uh, you know it's like a wizard. Uh, it's like this. So you just go ahead over here. You say this is my name of my application blah 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 which modules I want which language modules I want and then it's ready. It gives you everything. It's sort of like you know HTML boilerplate on steroids that kind of stuff and It's pretty straightforward, you know, but the only thing is you need to use a completely different API So you need to read the tide SDK API documentation. You need to you know pull out the stuff and once you do uh, You should be fine now the down the good sides are it's very easy to straight like package and deploy stuff you can submit to the mac app store you can get assets pretty easily but you can also come up purchase commercial support which you know is actually sometimes a good thing but the downside is you're limited by tides api so sometimes uh their api is not very comprehensive so i we weren't able to exactly explore how to if there are ways to work around it or ex like you know extend it and there's no native uh integration but overall, it fared pretty well, and we were pretty happy with Tide SDK from what we saw. So Adobe AR is like the most common, popular one, which was there for a very long time. Now, these guys were the first to start, and I'm pretty sure everyone's seen some Adobe AR live uh, program in their life one time or the other. Now, it also includes Flash Player, and apparently it supports mobile, but we couldn't spend enough time checking it out. Uh, 
it's pretty straightforward. So now the code for that as well, like the code to essentially load a file in the Adobe AR was pretty straightforward and it follows conventional JavaScript stuff. Now, the good side is it supports more platforms, allegedly. Now, one of the biggest problems with Adobe AR, which is a deal breaker for people like me and probably even a lot of other people, is the fact that you need to, your user need to download a separate runtime. You need to first download and install the Adobe runtime and then afterwards you can install the package. So this means that you're pretty much giving your branding and your value wrapped up inside Adobe's branding and package, which is something that, you know, is a problem at times. And one more thing is there's no good, there's not a very good debugger. Uh, at least we couldn't find one. But overall, it was pretty good. Oh, uh, sorry, this, this is a, a mistake over here. So there are a few more options over here. Like one of them is Qt. Now Qt, Qt Toolkit was uh, originally built in 1999. It has a lot of history. You can read the Wikipedia page about it. But uh, it is great for building GUI applications and it works cross-platform and it really works cross-platform. It's not just, you know, a marketing strategy or something. And one of the things you can do is you can actually combine Qt with the native widgets and stuff like that and you can combine it with the web view. Uh, this means that you can have your menu bars and stuff like that, but all the real heavy lifting is handled inside a WebKit browser, which is pretty cool. Now, and you can, the only problem with this is you have to embed resources using what is known as a uh, Q uh, resources module where you have to set up an XML file and stuff like that. It's a little tricky, but I mean, nothing that you can't figure out. So another option is GTK WebKit. So GTK is also one of the oldest tools that have been around. It's been around for a very long time. It's very mature. It's very stable. Uh, it also has the same strategy. You can have your buttons and your menus and stuff like that, which different solutions. Now, the only problem with this is it sort of works best on Linux and uh, from what I've seen, usually GTK apps on Windows and Mac are not as good as they run on Linux, but they're still there. There's still a lot of apps that run on GTK. Now, one really cool thing about uh, GTK WebKit is they have this thing called G-Object Introspection, which, uh, long story short, allows you to write and use the APIs offered by GTK and build GTK applications from a variety of different languages. So in all likelihood, if you want to use something slightly different, if you want to use C-sharp and build it, and you want to target Linux, you can just use GTK. Uh, the problem downside, one of them is distribution is a little complex because the documentation is not as much as the ones that are there in the proprietary or uh, other products. Now, CF Python. So CF Python is basically uh, Python, like a Chromium embedded framework with Python glue. This means that you can pretty much uh, uh, have a bridge between Python and JavaScript. Now we found that it's like, oh, oh, oh cool. So I mean, well, CF, you know, it just makes you question whether you know anything about computers or not. CF Python is a little bit more easier. Uh, it's a little complex to install. You know, you got to do with all this pip and stuff like that, which is not. Uh, and you have to do a lot of compiling, but you can mix it up with other UIs. And if you're into Python, you want to really have a solid thing in Python and you don't want to do CF, CF Python is a pretty good option. So one of the things is to summarize, I'm going to start summarizing right now, but what we realize is you can't have one winner now because everyone's requirements are different. Now for this, we decided there are going to be three winners for the entire thing. We've got the heavyweights, which means you're going to do a lot of IO, you need to do like some pretty uh, fancy stuff on the browser and then you've got your desktop edition which means that you got your regular application for your software and you just want to give someone a copy on their desktop which they can run and uh, uh, do stuff and the last one is quick and effective where you just need to quick you know quickly build a proof of concept and send it out to people and stuff like that now for the heavyweight category I actually picked CEF because even though it's difficult there's a reason like if, if something is really that difficult but still that popular there must be something around it and the more I read about it, the more I saw about it, it's just that the amount of functionality, it comes with things like a P2P stack and uh, network libraries, like incredible amount of libraries that you can actually use and extend and give more performance. It has its own build tools and stuff like that. It takes a little while to get into it, but if this is your primary bread and butter, it really makes sense to look thoroughly into CEF. Uh, the other thing is it has a very strong good Chromium heritage and you know that it, since it's like pretty much one of Google's most important business line applications It's not going to break very frequently so you can trust it and you know that it's going to be around for a long time Unlike a lot of other open source projects, which just can just be abandoned at any given day Now for the desktop edition I actually picked Tide SDK 
because it's pretty easy to get started and if you really plan your thing very quickly and you use php ruby or python one of these three platforms you can actually figure out a way that you can have your server side running and you can have the client side running and you can figure out how to share a lot of the stuff and uh, you can have an app which runs offline and runs online and uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility to do certain things that you can't do with our platforms now for the quick and effective one node webkit is the best I mean, Node WebKit in one word is just refreshing because you know you can build an entire desktop app in a single file. You can put a HTML, you can put your CSS, JavaScript, all the stuff over there, and you've got an entire desktop app which runs on your desktop. It's pretty cool if you ask me. Now, you're going to be limited by what Node.js can and cannot do, but if that's not a problem for you and you know enough about Node that uh, you know you're not going to be, it's not going to be a problem, you can go ahead and do that. So finally, coming back to me. What did we choose for a for a hybrid app technology? So believe it or not, we chose Qt. Now the reason we chose Qt over a lot of these other platforms that we saw was a lot of them were great because you know they're geared for getting up quick and dirty and just getting it out there. But there are certain other things that we needed. So we wanted stable quality and good commercial support. And the second thing is we wanted to have APIs to interact with stuff like system tray, uh, minimize the tray, and a lot of other stuff which a lot of the uh, systems did not give. Now Qt has a long legacy and it's been around for such a long time so they have things for even things like this. Now one of the problems is uh, and also the UI around the browser so for example we've got a settings dialog and all that stuff which looks and feels more or less like native dialogs. So we feel that this might be better for our customers instead of having everything inside the browser itself. And the last thing is on Windows installs can be scripted using installation builders like Nullsoft, uh, NSIS, Install Shield, and basically where you have to click next, 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 and keep, uh, and it works. Now, these are the problems that we've seen with Qt so far, and this is something that you'd probably see with most other systems. Now, the WebKit to native bridge was not as good as we expected. Now, the downside is you've got some stuff on your server side, like on your backend, and you want to, you know, make it communicate back and forth. It's not as seamless as you think it is, or not, not. And you can't even, you know, make it like a JSON thing because uh, your backend is written in C++ and C++ is terrible with JSON. The other thing is the Qt WebKit functionality was not very well documented, not as much as the rest of Qt. And we could not get the JavaScript debugger working properly. We wanted to have the ability to run the Chrome type of inspector right inside the uh, system. And it has to be recompiled every time there's a change in the JavaScript or CSS. This means that it takes about five to, like, five to eight minutes for us to, you know, for it to recompile everything. And we also have to manage memory manually, which is a problem because, you know, you need to uh, create and delete objects and things like that. It's a problem if you're coming from the JavaScript world. So that's the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank my team for basically doing all the work and figuring out how to build it in different platforms. And I just went ahead and made the slides. So the code's available. So you can go to github.com slash razorflow. And you have a meta refresh underscore braces repository. It has a code for all of the platforms that I talked about and some which I didn't even talk about. Uh, and there's also a wiki which contains detailed installation notes and uh, like screenshots and stuff like that, which you can download. And that's it. Yes? Um, performance wise, which was the better? Like, sorry, performance. So we could not do a thorough performance. Now, if you're talking about performance, you've got many different aspects of performance that you can talk about. Now, one of them is going to be performance of the native side. So, for example, if you're going to write direct C or C++ code, obviously that's going to be better than something written in JavaScript. But when it comes down to fundamental, like the website, the HTML performance, I'm guessing they should all be around the same because most of them use WebKit, WebKit and V8 or one of these common things. Now. My guess would be Chromium Embedded Framework would be the fastest because that has a lot of optimizations and they have the fork of WebKit called Blink, which is probably you know, uh, implored further. But if you're targeting performance, I would suggest look into CEF. Okay. And uh, for Node, <coughs> when you are packaging the application, you need to include the um, complete WebKit frame also, right? For the user, if the user doesn't also. How do, so that will be, that will increase the size of the whole package, right? 
So how do you manage that? So look, nowadays uh, you've got people with really fancy internet connections. So if you've got a 15 MB or even a 10 MB download, so usually what happens is WebKit's a pretty big library. WebKit's an extremely big library, and you've got WebKit, you've got all of these things, and now you've got two options. Now you can do either static linking or you can do dynamic linking. Now if you do static linking, you can just give them one dynamic, one complete executable. But if you do dynamic linking, you can either a hope that there's a WebKit already on the system, or b package it along. Now what I've seen is of like size obviously is going to be a big deal, but this is something that you just cannot avoid because you are sending all of the stuff. The other option is again to use what is already available on the system. Uh, then you know you're going to have a much more smaller size. So, but then again, web, until WebKit comes, until Microsoft starts shipping WebKit default with Windows, you're going to have to embed it till then. Same size as Chrome anyway. Yeah. No, actually, it's a little different because uh, then again, you know, Chrome. Has a automated background background downloader and stuff like that. There's some other stuff, but uh, yes, it is going to be big. Uh, in fact, if you really compile WebKit yourself, it almost comes out to around 1.5 GB of shared objects. It does all that compression and some really cool assembly magic to shrink it down. So yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, here, sit. Stay there. Can you see me? Wait, wait, wait. Right in front of you. Oh yeah, cool, cool. Oh sorry, thank you. <laughs> So, um, when you're creating hybrid applications, uh, the general interaction between the JavaScript and the native uh, native features like uh, hard disk or uh, playing music. So, the interaction between JavaScript and this these feature, how you generally manage it? Is there some framework or uh, so, writing your custom with? Right. So now there are different options that happen. Now, for me personally, I found Node WebKit the best. Uh, this means that so now, now some of them have a separate a separation of concerns where you're. JavaScript runs separately, and your native side runs separately. So some guys, for example, what they do is they allow you to uh, run a small local server directly, and your application talks to your local server just like how they would in a normal web app. The other thing is, for example, Chrome Embedded Framework does something little different. Where you need to extend V8, your application latches on to V8, so your real program native language, like native uh, business logic, is extended to the JavaScript language itself. So, in fact, it allows you to do certain things. Like, for example, if you want to do heavy mathematical processing, so you can literally call that function, and it gives you back the same stuff. So, to be very honest, the real problem is not with actually communicating back and forth. It's actually about object serialization and object parameters. Like, for example, if you've got your JSON, JavaScript generally deals with JSON. So, this means that your uh, your your native section should output an object which can be read by now transferring objects between the two is. Pretty straightforward. It's about figuring out a way the, which language they speak, making the common language. Now on web, JSON is that common language nowadays. Before it was XML and stuff like that, but now JSON does not work over here. So there are other native uh, ways. So you have to extend V8, you have to extend JavaScript object and stuff like that. Um, so I was just wondering uh, how much of a concern has it been about <coughs> reverse engineering and security? Um, because I kn I know for sure that Adobe Air the the packaged assets are pretty much out there in the file system for anybody to just go look into and you know uh, try to figure out and stuff like if I'm doing OAuth with an API I wouldn't want to store my tokens in plain text for everybody to see so have you what are your thoughts around that so that's actually a lovely question now one of the things you need to understand is when it's on the user's thing since no matter what happens. Ultimately, when your program is loaded into memory, they can always patch into the memory, no matter what encryption scheme that you have. Once your program is already patched into memory, you can just go into the memory right over there and read it. So your OAuth secret tokens are not secure. So if you're shipping your OAuth secret tokens as a part of your package, you're pretty much compromised right over there. Now that that's said, like most of these other things, like for example, Qt and WebKit and all these guys, they actually have a way to embed resources inside the inside the executable. Now even that also you can fail. In Linux, there's this uh, command called strings. Which you can pretty much run on a binary and extracts all the UTF-8 encoded strings, and usually that's enough to pull out all of the JavaScript files right there. How is the support for Qt uh, right now? Because earlier Nokia was supporting it. Right. So uh, interesting question. So Qt originally started by a company called Trolltech, which got acquired by Nokia, and now there's a company called Digia. Which have acquired it from Nokia. It's a little bit of uh, I don't know. I've not followed it very closely, but there is definitely an option to get commercial support. 
And one of the things is so many companies are so heavily invested in Qt. It's one of those things that you're pretty sure is not going to go away for a while. Uh, so you can go ahead with Qt. Thank you, guys.